See you guys another time. Bye -bye. It's a stick. Bye. Do you see? Yeah. It's a perfect stick. It's way bigger than her. It's a bit covered with spikes and still very much attached to the tree. But she can see that it is flawless. She hears the whistle. Oh no, it's dad calling. So she grabs the stick and she pulls and pulls and frees the stick and then rushes full speed back at dad. Which is actually not that fast because the stick is very, very heavy. And dad is at the middle of the yard, waving his arms, already cheering for her. Wait, is, is he saying drop it? Puppy's like, nah. Not my stick, not this perfect stick I just found. So she does a quick jump as that approaches and she dodges him. And about when she's about to land very gracefully, she crashes against something and falls on her bum. And she's all confused. Who the hell put this broken planter over here? And what is wrong with the cat? Never mind, cats are weird. Dad is almost here, so I got to rush. So the puppy goes towards the house, and when she is about to step inside, mom comes out and she grabs the stick from the other end. She looks angry. The puppy's so confused. Why is, why is everyone reacting like this? Why can't people see that this is a perfect stick? Why is everyone against my darling stick? But this puppy is not going to give up. This puppy is determined. She thinks to herself to someone string, never give up, never surrender. Believe it, and you're halfway there. Hang in there, kitten. Anyway, she's almost got it. It's, it's actually working. Mom is losing her grip, and when she's about to get it, ow! She feels a pinch on her mouth, ow! Another pinch on her nose and her ear. What, what's happening? It's ants. Ants are everywhere, they're coming out of the stick. She's confused and mom has seized the stick. The puppy can see that it is all over. Mom is very angry and she doesn't appreciate her darling. This is game development. We are all puppies. We find these amazing ideas in the wild and for some reason no one understands them. No one can see the value. They just keep get shutting down. And we reach the end of the road like the puppy. What would you do? Would you continue fighting? I've been working for 10 years on creative fields and I've realized that there's only one solution, which is killing your darlings. So, hi, I'm Erika. And I am here to talk about murder. And you might be wondering, what makes me an expert in murder? Well, you see, I am Mexican. <laughs> we came up with the Day of the Dead, so that kind of makes us good with this. Uh, but yeah, I've been working in New Zealand for about four years, but I spent most of my life in Mexico. And yes, I am very much a cliche Mexican that loves spicy food, tequila, and skulls. And if you're wondering, a $30 bottle of tequila is not good tequila. I've been working for 10 years on creative fields, and this is very varied. I've been working on comic books, films, animation, book illustration, a little bit of everything. And I also have a small business with my husband. It's called Small Robot Studio. The business, not the husband. <laughs> We create 3D educational content and we have a YouTube channel. Uh, you can look for it, it's called Small Robot Studio. We have over 70,000 subscribers. And in video games, of course, I'm also doing video games. I work as a 2D and 3D artist at Cerebral Fix. If you don't know us, we are a video game company that's based in Christchurch and we also do everything that you can imagine. Here's a little bit of my work, in case you're wondering. Mostly characters, but uh, the world has led me to also do environments. And this is my dog. Look at her. She's gorgeous. Her name is Posey. Anyway, what is killing your darlings? Killing your darlings is for creatives. Who here thinks uh, you're a creative? You do a creative job. All right, most hands, most hands. Um, who here is an artist? Good, good. Who is a developer? Nice, more developers than I expected. Maybe designers? Cool, cool. Uh, producers? Nice. Miscellaneous? 
Nice, my favorite. If you are in a role where you are solving problems, you're creative, that's it. Creatives come up with solutions. Sometimes it feels like only when you're doing art or something similar like that, that is creativity, but no. When you are exploring different options, when you have to think outside of the box, that is creativity. Even if the problem is, how do I get milk on the fridge when it's full? Do you have to be creative for that? So, killing your darlings, as you might have expected, yes, I'm talking about an analogy, not real murder. Please don't deport me back to Mexico. <laughs> It is about recognizing that you have grown fond to an idea, but this idea is unsuitable. And you gotta sever that attachment. You don't wanna marry your ideas too soon. You don't wanna get emotionally attached to them very, very soon. Now, I came up with this um, concept when I was studying screenwriting. It turns out that this is advice that has been uh, given out by writers for generations, centuries really. But it's, so I've also encountered this in my experience, in my career, and this talk is based on those two things and the collective advice of several people in cerebral fix who are in different roles and also are not involved in murder. So, let's talk about why you want to kill. And the first reason why you want to kill is because you want to unblock your chakras. And I'm talking about your creative chakras. When people ask me what you do for your job and I say concept artist, they think, oh, you make pretty pictures. That's not what I do. My job is to come up with many ideas, many, many ideas. The only thing is that I deliver them on a visual media. But most of the ideas that I come up with, they're never going to see the light. They're never going to be completed. That is the nature of creative roles. Most of the work that you do is going to end up on the bin or the archive, which is just another way to say the bin. I want to make sure that my stream of ideas is constantly flowing. I want a clean stream that doesn't have uh, gunk or anything blocking it. If I get fixated on an idea very soon, my creative stream is going to get slowly, slowly, and slowly more blocked. I'm going to be creating less ideas. So I'm not going to be good at my job if I'm not creating ideas. That's why I want to make sure that it is always flowing. And a really easy advice that I can give you for this is make sure to never trust your first idea. The first thing that comes to mind is probably going to be the most cliche thing. It's going to be the most recent movie that you watch, the most recent game that you watch. It's just going to be what everyone else thinks about. I, of course, have experience coming up with an idea. I mean, like, I need to draw it right now. I grab my tablet, I make my sketch, and I think that I made the most innovative design ever, only to realize that it's just a thing that I literally just watched, and it has been done many, many times. And if you're wondering, but like Erika, I've many times experienced that the first idea was the best idea. I believe you, I have experienced it as well. But you went through a process. You didn't think of one thing and just stay there. You explored, you went through 10, 11, 20 ideas, I don't know. And you realized through all of those extra ideas that the first one wasn't most suitable. But it was the other ideas that proved that actually the first one was the best. So make sure to go through the process. Don't get stuck on your first idea. So we want to make sure, especially at the start of this creative process, that we create an environment for ourselves where we are fostering many, many, many ideas. We don't want to adopt one idea very early. No, we want to make sure that we're exploring lots. Because when I get fixated on one idea, many ideas are not going to be born. Now, the thing is that interruptions are costly. Inter we just can't afford interruptions because we are humans. And I'm sure you've experienced this. You come up with a wonderful idea and you're like, oh my God, I gotta write it down. And then the most gorgeous kitten is standing in front of you and you get distracted and when you're gonna write it down, you've forgotten the idea. This happens to me all the bloody time. It's so annoying. We cannot afford this. We're losing ideas all the time because we, our attention spans just betray us. 
There is one example I can give you, specifically for concept art. Uh, if I'm giving the brief of, you gotta create a cat sword, the first thing that I'm gonna do is grab a vivid marker, and I'm gonna make a lot of tiny drawings. These are called thumbnails, silhouettes, doesn't really matter, but the idea is that I am doing a technique that doesn't let me get distracted. It doesn't let me do a lot of detail, I can only work in shadows. Uh, it's very, very small drawings, so I cannot get caught up in like the, the weeds of like this and this and No, I am moving on. Even if I don't finish one idea, I move on to the next one, because I want to make sure that my creative flows are going, 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 going. I don't want to stop. I don't want to lose ideas, because I can think of the kitchen as an external extraction. And you're like, Boy, I am very focused. When I work, I work. Well, other ideas can also distract you. So just just make sure that you have a technique that works specifically for you, for what you do, that allows you to keep moving. Another reason why we want to kill is because we want to claim insurance from the dead. And by insurance, I mean experience. Because the mastery of your career is paved by all the dead ideas that you've created, and also live ones. Insurance is the best thing that you can get out of the dead. Every time that you go through things, regardless if you achieve it or not, you are getting better at it. You are improving, you are learning things. So even if your ideas don't get realized, the next time there's gonna be something extra that you can offer. And this reminds me of when I was in uni making uh, my 3D modeling final. I had been working for many, many hours. It was late. I had to deliver this on the morning. And Maya crashed. And as Maya loves to do, corrupted my file. And you know, I was a very mature professional and I didn't have any backup. So I lost all my work. And I was devastated, absolutely devastated. And I had to spend all night working, re redoing the thing. I was telling my mom, crying maybe a little bit. She patiently listened. And when I finished venting, she told me, second time you're gonna be faster. Which is the worst advice you'd wanna hear in that time. <laughs> I just wanted it to do the work for me, but she was right. The first time that I did it, it took me 10 hours. Second time, it took me four hours, and I actually did it better. Nowadays, after many years, I can do that in an hour. That's the value of the insurance. Now, I know that this advice sucks to hear. You're gonna be better the next time. But this is not how we play roguelike games. If you are not familiar with roguelike games, this is games that are designed for you to fail, for you to lose, to die, and every time that you lose, you gain experience, you gain coins, you get something, so when you try again, you are better. We want to face our career the same way. We want this uh, acceptance, this expectation of failure in our career. And when we play these games, they are very, very fun. But it's not because failure doesn't hurt. It's because we are focused on what is coming next. It's the expectation of how much better I'm going to be next time I try it. So think about it. Every time that you get a darling killed, and it, yeah, it hurts a little bit, think about it. We are playing this game and we're gonna get better every time. Now the third reason why we wanna kill is because if we don't kill fast enough, we're gonna become the victim. That is the victim of sunk cost fallacy. If you have never heard about sunk cost fallacy, think about going to the movie theater and hating the movie that you're watching. And you're sitting there, people are being loud, the popcorn sucks, the movie theater is sticky, but you already paid for it, so you just stay there. That is sunk cost fallacy. Or you are playing a video game, you have spent a uh, hundred hours on it, you're not really enjoying it, but you just push yourself to finish it because like, you're already there. Now sunk cost fallacy, it's deceiving because we think that I've already spent so much money, time, resources on it, I'm just gonna spend a little bit more and it's gonna be better. 
but it's not really gonna be better. You're just losing, losing, losing more. We gotta be sure that we recognize when our darlings become this. Because sometimes the best option is just to kill them. That's the best way that you're gonna stop the losses and you're actually gonna start gaining. And if you're wondering how do I know when my darling has become this, how can I recognize that I'm becoming the victim? Like everything in life, you gotta look for red flags. And I already actually told you the very first red flag, which is I'm stuck on the very first idea. That is the easiest red flag that you can follow. Now, another red flag, I'm doing this because it's cool. And that's it. I don't have anything against cool things. I mean, this is the only reason why I'm doing something. When I'm telling like, yeah, but how does that work? It's just cool. That is just not good enough in game development. I can say it differently. How does my darling relate to the design pillars of my game? For anyone that is not familiar with the design pillars, these are ideas, these are concepts, these are parameters that define what is your game, what makes it a unique experience. I can give you the example of Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. One design pillar that is actually very common in most Nintendo games is that this game is accessible to all players, regardless of the experience, regardless of their age. This is something that anyone can pick up and it's easy to learn. Another pillar, is that exploration is rewarded. This is a vast map, and they want you to look everywhere, look behind the tree, look under the rock, and you're gonna gain something out of that. Another pillar, experimentation. This is lovely, especially in Tears of the Kingdom, because there is no one unique solution. If you have a puzzle to solve, you can do it on the best way possible, or you can brute force it, and it's still gonna work. That is part of the experience they crafted. And another Another one is that this is non-linear progression. I can look at my map, decide where I want to work, where I want to go, and that's great. I don't have to go specifically in this path that someone gave me. That is Tears of the Kingdom specifically. I'm not saying every game needs to be like that. This is the identity of this game. Now, because I'm very cool and I'm going to be working for Nintendo, I am pitching the idea of a boss, and this is a scary creature, a hybrid of a horse and a man with a melted face, crooked teeth, a haunch, bony limbs. This character used to be a cleric, but his bloodlust turned him into a monster. And this is a very, very difficult boss that is blocking an item that blocks uh, story progression. This is a great, 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 great idea, but it's gonna be shut down in two seconds because it doesn't fit the design pillars. It is great if I'm thinking about Bloodburn, but it's not good for Tears of the Kingdom. So if you cannot answer the question, how does, uh, how does my darling relate to the ultimate goal, to the design pillars, then that's a red flag. You are wasting time on that darling. I got the wrong one? There we go. All right. So you follow my advice. You kill the bunch of ideas. Left and right, it's a very gory scene. But you found one darling, one amazing idea that deserves to live. Something precious, something that you want to share to the world. Perfect, we are creatives. This is what we want to do. Now your darlings is still very vulnerable to a very murderous world. So, let's talk about how you want to improve the odds of your darlings. How we want to make them stronger. How do we prevent them to get murdered by someone else? And the first thing is you want to save your darlings for the right time and the right crowd. I've had the experience to work with some big clients in Cerebral Fix, and I mean big clients, scary, giant clients and own every, everything, everyone, probably they own me and I don't know. And those clients, it's like really exciting, it's like the artist bucket list, like, oh, I get it, I have, I'm, one day I'm gonna work for them. And then when you work with them, it's kind of dry. They are 
the people that kill the most ideas. They are, they just have a very square, straight vision of what they want. Anything outside of that, they're just gonna murder it. So you gotta be aware of that. When there's a lot of money, the stakes are very high. And people that invest money, they don't wanna lose their money, they wanna make more money. And this is the reason why we see a lot of sequels come out. Because those are proven franchises, because they are audiences already out there that are gonna buy them. There is a guaranteed return in the investment. New ideas, you don't have that. Which is why it's way more likely that you're gonna see Jurassic Space Park in movies very soon before you see your unique idea being realized. Make sure that if you have something really, really, really exciting, something that you really believe in, sometimes it's just better to save it for yourself. Make your own projects. You are not only your job. There's plenty of things that you can do on your own. But don't be too scared. I'm not telling you to just guard all your ideas and never share anything. Because then nothing is gonna get realized. And if you're being paid for this, you're not doing your job right. There's many ways in which you can protect your ideas, even in a work environment. The reality of a work environment, of a professional environment, is that you're being paid and the ideas don't belong to you. But if there's something that you really want to protect, I recommend that you talk to your managers, to whoever is uh, that you're working with, because you can do something like, uh, uh, what's it called, a non-exclusivity contract. So in case an idea doesn't get realized, you can, it gets back to you, and you can realize it uh, by yourself, by someone else. This is another talk, so let's carry on before I get too distracted in this tangent. Another way to improve the odds of my darlings by working with your team. Don't work against your team. Game development is always a co-op game. As much as there are solo developers that can do everything, that do art, uh, all the code, they do sound, we always need other people. We need the audience that are gonna play our games. We need distributors. This is, there's always gonna be a team that you need to work with. So you wanna make sure that we are all in this together, that we are going in the same direction and not pulling in different directions. Find the best way to communicate your idea. When I'm talking to artists, sometimes I can do a very ugly sketch and show them and everyone is like, yeah, we all understand. But if I show it to the CEO of the company, she's gonna be like, um, do I pay you for this? If I'm gonna be pitching an idea to her, I need to spend a bit of extra time polishing that idea. Make sure that I'm communicating correctly. Sometimes I even have to practice my words. English is not my first language. When I trip with my words, I get lost. And then she's just like, I don't even know what you mean, so it's probably not a good idea. So make sure you take the time to prepare the things. You do due diligence to share the, your ideas the best way possible to improve the odds. If they don't understand you, they're not gonna see the potential. You may have experienced the, that you think of something and the moment that you say it out loud and you put it on paper, it's like, oh, it, it sounded a lot better when it was in my head. It's very, very important that you take these steps, that you pitch it maybe uh, with your partner, with your friends, with your family, show them in advance before you put your idea in a place of risk. Ah, keep missing the button. And also think about your team. Anticipate what this idea means to your team. Maybe your idea so far checks all the boxes. It is, it is great. It fits the design pillars. But it requires a lot of extra dev, a lot of extra design. As an artist, I'm like really happy, like, ah, oh, yeah, I just have to do one extra drawing, but my team has to spend extra months to realize that. So that could make it a non-suitable idea. Try to anticipate. Make sure that you have discussions with your teams of what this idea means. And maybe there's not a lot of things that you can anticipate, but consult what that is with the person that is gonna be working with that. Especially if you're in a role that is not production, if you're making decisions but you're not the person realizing the thing, make sure that you are consulting your team. Otherwise, they're just going to not be very happy. You want to make sure that you're workshopping ideas. 
you want to make sure that ideas are evolving. When I put an idea out there to my team, I want it to start bouncing, to start feeding from their expertise, to start feeding from their experience, from their own darlings. I want them to uh, mix, to grow together. And I want to see a team that is getting excited about it. This is great. But when I see the opposite, when ideas, I just put them out there and their people are just like, ah, oh, yeah, okay. That, yeah, that's, that's the idea. There's no improvement to be done. Or when it fights another idea, it's like, oh, but I have this really cool idea for the walls. But we could do this other thing. And then you start like brewing this discontent between teammates. And just in general, the team confidence starts to go down. This is a red flag. This is possibly something that is not going great. Gotta make sure that your team has confidence. And not just lukewarm confidence. You want a strong majority. That is what is telling you that a darling is going in the right direction. Now, you want to forge your darling with fire. And fire is playtesting. Platus, Platus, that is the best thing you can do. When you are creating a game, we, when we are creating a game, we are doing a lot of assumptions. We are saying the player is going to like this, the player is going to understand this, the player is going to connect with this. And maybe we are making educated decisions because I saw that work in this other game, because I saw this help here, so I'm making the same thing. But everything is an assumption until you get a player to try it and to prove that it was correct or not. We are walking blindly and we are hoping that we're going on the right direction. So play test as much as you can to make sure that you are actually on the right direction and not just heading off a cliff. There's a really cool article that I recommend, The Illusion of Skill. It is on the game development blog. You'll find it there. It's, it's brilliant. There's just a couple quotes that I got from there. Just imagine an onslaught of angry reviews. Uh, probably read it better here. Uh, angry reviews of something that could have been easily avoided from getting feedback before launch. You don't want to wait until the thing is on Steam and everyone gives you feedback publicly and you get an overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly negative <laughs> review. And here's another. Spend as little time as possible chasing bad ideas. Playtesting will show you what is a bad idea. Spend all your energy, spend all your time chasing the right ideas. Playtest frequently, playtest very often, playtest in small iterations. Don't expect your, uh, your tester to uh, catch this and that and that and then this mechanic and then this other thing. No, go small, slowly build up. Get a lot of opinions, different people, different demographics. That is going to make your darling stronger. All right, you follow my advice because you are very wise. Your darling has evolved from this tiny thing to a very buff darling that is ready to take on the world. But the reality is that murder is inevitable. Sometimes it doesn't matter how hard we work, murder is still going to happen and our darling is just not going to make it. Sometimes we have to accept the things we cannot control. This is a sad truth, this is a hard pill to swallow, but lots of great ideas get shut down. Sometimes it's because of ego of the person in charge of the money. Sometimes the audience is fickle, sometimes all they want to play is Fortnite. There's a lot of factors that we cannot control. You are not your work. If your work is getting shut down, it doesn't mean that you don't have value or any of that. It's, there's lots and lots of things that are out of our control. Resources are not limited. Sometimes money runs out. Sometimes time runs out. Sometimes we even lose motivation. Mental health happens. Lots of things may happen. But don't forget, our career is a rogue light game. 
always remember that, always tell that to yourself. Whenever things are not going great, remind yourself that you are winning just by doing the things you are winning. You are getting experience and growth is not visible right away. If I think about last week, I cannot really see how much better I've become since last week. But if I think about five years ago, if I think about 10 years ago, oh my God, I'm, I'm such a much better artist than I was. I know so much more. And if I think about how great I'm gonna be in 20 years if I haven't died, <laughs> it's just very exciting. <laughs> I, it's very, very exciting to think about the projects, to think about the people. So focus on that. Focus on the process. Be passionate about the process of creating, not so much about the creations. I learned from a friend uh, from Cerebral Fix called Taylor this uh, Lego mindset analogy. And he told me that when he was a kid, he loved playing with Legos. He was building things, but he only had a couple breaks, he didn't have that many breaks. And whenever he finished something, he was like, good, I made it. Now I wanna keep building stuff. And in order to build more stuff, he had to destroy things. We gotta destroy sometimes to create more. Think about this, it's fine to kill your darling. Sometimes you're, they're just not gonna make it. But if you, really care about just creating, 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 it's gonna hurt a little a bit less. Sometimes we also just have to feel the feelings. Sometimes it just sucks. As much as we try to be positive, as much as we try to think about the experience, about the good things, about murder, sometimes it just doesn't work. Sometimes you just have to fall flat on your face, ugly cry. Just make sure you're keeping a professional. Don't burn bridges while you're in this. Take some space to feel what you're feeling, to be comfortable with this. It's not easy to be okay with rejection. It's, it's a skill. It hurts. It's always going to hurt. But the more that you do it, the more that you're going to get better at it. And I'm not telling you it's gonna stop hurting. One day you're not gonna feel it, you're not gonna care. No, I don't want that. I want you to grow a callus. When you play guitar for the first time, the tips of your fingers are gonna hurt. The friction of the strings, the pressure kinda like hurts and you can only play for so long. But when you play more and more and more, you start to grow a callus. And it's not that your fingers stop feeling. You don't get numb. You actually develop more and more sensitivity. You develop better perception of pressure, of distance. And that's what I want you. I, that's what I want for you. I want you to grow a callus that still feels a lot, but the pain is not as intense. When you forget about the pain, you become apathetic. You don't want to be an apathetic creator, especially because as you go in your career, you're suddenly going to find that w you were before the person whose ideas got killed, but then you maybe got on a higher position, a lead position, and a manager position. You are now the CEO, you're somewhere higher up, and now you control the ideas, the darlings of a bunch of people. Now you're in the position to kill. And if you grow numb, and if you don't feel, you're gonna kill merciless. You're gonna forget what it was like to be in the bottom. You're gonna forget the pain. You don't want that. You're gonna kill for sure, but you wanna kill to empower. You never wanna kill to frustrate. Darlings die. Darlings die, and it sucks. Actually, no. Uh, darlings do not die. Darlings hibernate. The only way that you can really, really permanently kill a darling is if you stop creating altogether. If I decide to stop being an artist, if I decide to stop coming up the ideas, that's when darlings truly die. 
otherwise darlings are gonna hibernate. Darlings are gonna just stay there in your mind. And darlings are like weeds. In winter, we may not see a lot of weeds, but as soon as the time is right, as soon as the temperature rises, as soon as there's a little bit of dirt, a little bit of sunlight, they will bloom. When the time is right, darlings will thrive. Sometimes it takes a week, sometimes it takes 10 years, but darlings will live. Thank you. Alrighty, I've been talking a lot, but now it's your turn. What are your burning questions about murder? <laughs> Good one over here. Uh, so my question is, when you're learning a new skill and you understand the theory behind it, how do you deal with the frustration of the application um, in your work? So you get it in your head and you understand how it works, but it's not showing up in your work. So like you're learning something and you don't see like the progress yet on your work. Yeah, so like for example, doing anatomy, I'm like, I know the foot looks like that, but I'm not drawing it that way because my hand, like, it's a disconnect between your mind and your hand, sort of, in that analogy. Yeah, 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 I, I get what you mean. Um, I'm currently experiencing that because I'm dealing with a lot of environment, art, and I don't have too much experience with that. It's, um, when, you're, when you're learning a motor skill, your hand and your mind is not learning at the same time. Like sometimes your mind can see the things, but your hand just cannot do the thing. It's honestly, it's just like try again, go over and over and over. If you have someone that can guide you, that makes it a lot better. Because they always tell you, to get better you have to practice, do the thing over and over and over again. But if you're doing it wrong, you're not gonna get better. So if you can find someone that can point you out exactly at what is happening, sometimes it's as simple as like, oh, you're holding the pencil wrong, or maybe try this other exercises first, master those before you go into this next level. That's maybe when you're gonna start to see a bit more of the improvement reflected. Thank you. No worries. Any other killer? One more here. We've got one here and then one here. Um, when iterating, how do you stop your influence of your favorite designs from influencing others? When time runs out. What's that, sorry? <laughs> when the time runs out. Oh. I, it, you can iterate forever, which is also a problem. So the, the best thing that I have come up for that is to set deadlines. If I know that I have a whole week to create, a deadline, to create an asset, for example, maybe the first day I'm gonna be iterating. But at the end of the day, I have to make a choice before I move on. And usually the same with while client work, you will have a limit in which you need to just to start producing or you're not gonna make the thing on time. Thank you. No worries. So let's say you have a darling and it doesn't die. In fact, it blooms. But darling services come in and they rehome your darling. So you're no longer working on it, but uh, someone else's. How do you deal with the fact that you're no longer watching, well, working on your darling, but you are having to watch it progress and evolve in ways that like, you necessarily wouldn't agree with? It's things that you cannot control. Maybe that specific version of your darling is doomed by people that have bad ideas, but it doesn't mean that the darling is untouchable. If we think about something like XCOM, uh, the, the guy that came up with it eventually have to like give it up, and the game developed and continues developing in many ways that he doesn't like but the core of the game 
it just it can be done in many ways, and he has done it in many ways. Uh, he basically reskinned it. Like, it's no longer like space military. He turned it into wizards, uh, more like D and D theme. Like, so maybe that's how you can deal with that. Just do it better, just slightly different, so you can get away. <laughs> Don't be shy. I don't kill in New Zealand. <laughs> well, if you are shy, you can still find me around the conference. If you want to contact me, that's um, where you can find me, Erika Kasab, it's my handle. I'm an old millennial, so I'm only on Instagram. <laughs> Uh, but that's my website, that's also the Small Robot Studio YouTube. Uh, I'm here, I've got business card if you wanna as well, if you forget easily. So yeah, don't be shy, talk to me. Talk to people in Cerebral Fix. And thank you so much for being here. <laughs>